uh, appreciate everyone showing up and uh, hopefully you're enjoying uh, some spring weather. It's not quite warm enough here in the New York area, but uh, we're hoping. So I uh, hope you guys are ready for some continued volatility. In addition to it being a midterm year, there's a lot of headline risk. Uh, April itself is not performing uh, as it does historically, and that is a concern to us. So um, with that, we're going to uh, get into some of the things that we're looking at and what we're doing in the newsletter um, at StockTradersOmanac.com. And um, just a quick word from our lawyers. This is for inf informational purposes only. Past performance not a guarantee of future results. Not an offer to buy or sell any securities. Do your own due diligence. Consult with your advisors and do some research and uh, stick to your system. So uh, I got a bunch of slides here. I'm going to roll through a few quickly. Just a little look at the things that we do out there. The 22 Almanac is out. A look at the original book. Some of the places we get to appear uh, in the media. My Super Boom book, which coming uh, pretty close to true. I made that forecast for 38,820 in May of 2010. And Yale's old original book, the uh, Don't Sell Stocks on Monday, which came out of one of the pages in the Almanac, as well as my little book of stock market cycles and the Almanac investor book we put out. Uh, I think that was 06 or 078. And um, just, uh, you know, we lost Yale last November at 98 years old. And we finally, since it was a kind of a peak COVID time when he passed, we were able to disperse his ashes, um, some into the Hudson, some with mom. Uh, so that's, that's where we're at on a, on a personal level. Our philosophy, whoops, is um, a twist off of the old Santiana quote that everyone knows that those who fail to remember the past are condemned to repeat it. I like to say that those who study market history are bound to profit from it. And we are process, uh, you know, 50 years we've been looking at all these patterns, uh, testing them uh, annually, publishing our findings in the Stock Traders Almanac, uh, updating it weekly and month monthly in the newsletter service on our blog as well, Almanac Trader on Twitter. Um, and we use all this information to construct portfolios. We're not only seasonals, but our foundation is in cycles, seasonalities, and recurring patterns. We look at fundamentals and technical analysis market internals and sentiment, of course, what's going on in the world of geopolitics and monetary policy and current trends and the economy. Um, our, uh, we're looking at April here, um, has had a stellar track record. Uh, it is in trouble right here. Since 06, the Dow has been up 16 Aprils in a row, average gain of about 2.9%, S&P up 15 of the last 16, um, up average of 3.1%, was the first month to gain a thousand Dow points. Finally, the Dow reclaimed its position, or April reclaimed its position as the number one Dow month, the number one S&P month, and it's a third best for NASDAQ since 71. But it hasn't been super uh, great. Um, this year, we you know, have some, um, there's a little bit of weakness in midterm years. April, it, it ranks a little bit lower, which I have a little table on that in the next slide, but I wanted to throw this one out there because uh, this is the midterm years and the dotted lines and the current years for the Dow, S&P, NASDAQ, and the Russell 2000. Um, this is from uh, last week, a couple of days ago. We're, we're rallying a little bit here, so that would be encouraging. But the fact that the market is down in the month when it's normally up is a concern for us, as well as the best six months, which started out great uh, in November. Um, but with inflation and the raid hike cycle starting and the invasion of the Ukraine by Russia, you know, we've got some other, some other factors here and um, years when, you know, the best six months don't work, it's not a great sign moving forward. So we think this adds to the, the concern for continued volatility. We've been talking about this expected volatility in the midterm years since we put out our forecast last December. So this is a look at the typical midterm April, um, and uh, what we're doing to 22, definitely a concern for us. If we close out the month on, a, on an upswing, that would be positive. Um, there's some other, um, you know, events, uh, uh, issues that we're looking at. Um, generally looking for sideways action volatility over the next several months into, uh, you know, Q3 ahead of the, uh, the midterm elections. A little look at midterm year April performance down from number one to seven um, uh, for S&P and Dow 
from three to six for the NASDAQ. You can see the Russell 2000 does better. Um, as you can see, it's been performing a little bit better recently. The big concern, um, though it seems to be a little bit off the the uh, uh, the main you know financial news headlines, even though it's still there, is this this war in the Ukraine. Um, when we were at the Money Show in February, putting out um, you know our, our newsletter that week uh, on the Thursday it was just uh, on Invasion Day, and we put together this table looking at um, events where there was uh, you know an incursion over sovereign. Uh, line sovereign borders as well as an energy um, you know impact which is what you know the real issue is and most of these wars are, are are over resources anyway but what you can see here in this table we've included you know one of my first real memories as a child was the the oil embargo I mean I remember Watergate as well but I rem really remember waiting on gas lines and odd and even days back in the 70s and you can see that when these these um these events, these occurrences take longer. It has a, a, a greater toll on the market. Uh, you can see some of the longer, you know, World War II and the energy crisis. But um, for the most part, if the, you know, war, the invasion can be, um, you, you know, wrapped up or, or at least they can, they can come to some peace agreement, uh, you know, within a period of months, it's, it's better for the market. But in general, uh, the first few months after the invasion, the market doesn't do a whole lot. But six, nine, 12 months out, um, it, it, it tends to, the market tends to rebound some. So um, that's a little bit, you know, supportive for us. We're still concerned about what's going on over there. Uh, also, we had a down first quarter in the midterm year. And the interesting thing when we put this table together to me was all of the familiar words that we're dealing with this year, war, inflation, rates, um, oil, energy crises. And you can see, um, Generally, this this uh, these midterm years that have a down Q1, um, it, it tends to be the worst of it. But uh, the negativity does continue into Q2, which we're expecting, kind of flat lines in Q3, and then picks up in Q4. And this is where we, you know, have the um, the sweet spot of the four-year cycle beginning, which we'll we'll get to in a couple of seconds uh, or a couple of minutes as we as we move through this deck. But in general, um, you know it. It, there's an issue here. You can see that uh, a lot of these are first term situations. You can see foreign countries uh, and, and you know foreign entanglements happening at the beginning of um, a president's term. They tend to test them. And I think that's what uh, Russia and Putin have been uh, sort of um, gambling on a little bit here. So that's the uh, midterm year with down Q1s. Uh, one of the other things that um, we've been concerned with going into this year was the uh, mean reversion. Uh, we put this table, this chart together, uh, or initially, again, we, we, we recycled it when we uh, had the, the first anniversary of the pandemic low, where the S&P was up 76% year over year. And, you know, you just, everyone knows that that can't continue. Uh, that, that type of return is, is unsustainable. And what we've seen here over the years is that the um, average rolling one-year percent change is about 9.4%. And you can see uh, here in 21, 22, 21, we've been reverting. Whoops, sorry. Let's see if we can go back to that. A little happy with the mouse. Um, we, we're probably going to end up dipping below this mean reversion in Q2, Q3. We wouldn't be surprised if that happens, but this is something that's been weighing on the market. Um, our initial um, feeling on the Fed was uh, that we'd get four hikes, unlike um, a lot of other uh, analysts out there looking for five, six, seven, eight. I don't see us getting seven or eight or nine, maybe five or six at this point. But we think the 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 um, the, the ones that are in the bag is, is one at, at the quarterly meetings when they have the uh, summary of economic projections, excuse me. So definitely at least four hikes, uh, probably a quarter point. Some people are clamoring for, for 50 at the next one, maybe in May. Uh, I'm not sure the, the Fed is ready to... Um, accelerate so quickly but uh when they look at the numbers they, they they just might either way if we get the four quarters or even a, a 50 in there or five or, or six or so the rates will still be historically low and that's something that i think people need to keep in their minds i know there's a an increase and 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 the um the move higher is is uh, you know substantially on a, uh, substantial on a percentage basis but it's still historically low interest rate environment we're not so convinced recession here is a foregone conclusion. Um, what we've shown here is that uh, the difference between the 10-year 
which everyone was talking about these inversions, which there have been some, not, not, not a complete inverted yield curve, just a, a few of the spreads on the curve. But looking at the um, 10 year minus the two year, which is what everyone got um, worked up about versus the 10 year minus the Fed funds rate, you see something here that hasn't happened over the years. Normally the two of these uh, ratios run um, very correlate, at least in direction, not necessarily magnitude. And you can see how they all, when they dip, both of them dip below zero, uh, it ends up leading into recession. But what we have here is a diversion. You can see at the far right end of this chart where uh, you have um, the 10 year minus the two year going down towards that you know zero and into the inversion area, but the 10 year minus the Fed funds rising. So that divergence is encouraging to us that we're not necessarily uh, on a <clears throat> straight line to a recession. Inflation uh, is, is an issue that we're all concerned with. We're all seeing it. Um, I just uh, anecdotally, uh, you know, I often go get a nice large ice Dunkin' coffee, black, um, and it used to be 302 through the drive through Recently, it's gone up to 389, a 29% increase. So everyone's feeling inflation in a lot of places. But what we've seen, looking at the comparison from the another one from the FRED database, which is a great resource if you don't go there, um, you can see the the uh, website down here, fred.stlouisfed.org. We've seen over the years, <clears throat> inflation tends to peak when crude oil peaks. Uh, crude oil's come back a, a bit. Inflation's, there's been talk since we first started looking at this chart that inflation is peaking. Again, we'll be tracking the price of, of uh, energy and crude oil here, as well as the PPI and the CPI, uh, looking for a peak in inflation. PE ratios have been elevated. They seem to be coming back down. You can see a comparison of the straight S&P PE ratio versus the Schiller PE ratio, which is a um, inflation adjusted, uh, uh, you know, over the last 10 years, uh, a bit higher, not as high as it was at the dot-com boom, but um, coming down a bit. So, you know, PEs can, can come down when prices go down as well. So earnings go up, which has been the case this earnings season, as well as uh, prices coming down we're, we're having a little bit of a, a you know, return to normal for PEs. The midterm year, just going to jump into this chart. This is a one-year seasonal pattern of midterm election years. You can see all years in black. Uh, this is based on the S&P 500, all midterm years in that blue line. Um, the purple is Democratic midterm years. The green is first-term midterm years. And the red down at the bottom is what we're in now, which is the second year of a new Democratic president basically first term midterm years for Democrats. And um, you can see that we're tracking that that pattern a little bit more amplitude, a little bit lower. Uh, we've basically um, got uh, to the low, uh, you know, of, of, mid, of the average midterm year, though some of these uh, um, midterm drops have been, you know, more down to the 12, 13, 14%. This is the average here. And it looks like we're tracking the second year of new Democratic presidents pretty well. Um, we could look to test those lows again later in Q2 and you know Q3, early Q4 with that typical October low and a midterm year just ahead of the midterm elections. Um, it's a chart that uh, is very instructive to us and hopefully you can, it'll help you plan out that, that volatility, at least prepare for that volatility we're looking at over the next several months. Um, some of the positive factors, we think some of the negatives have, have been satisfied uh, as you just saw in that chart. We did have the um, down January barometer, down first five days, even though Santa Claus rally was up, but we've hit basically those, those, um, those lows already uh, on average. Rates will remain historically low, as I mentioned before. Uh, we're gonna look at some technical support of the invasion low, still holding that intraday low uh, on February 24th. Economy definitely seems to be on firmer footing. We've got clarity from the Fed and you know what we like to to say our line, one of the lines that Yale created midterm years is a bottom picker's paradise. We're gonna look for that sweet spot in um, the Q4 to Q2 of the pre-election year, as well and uh, as having reached some extreme fear and bearish sentiment levels. We didn't get the real, you know, VIX um, volatility, you know, the, the real spike in, in, in a VIX volatility that we see at lows, nor did we get any real deep um, equity only put call ratios uh, that were quite low. but. Um, we've had some extreme fear, and I have a couple of things to show you there. Midterm years, bottom pickers paradise. Just going to quickly go through this. The average gain from the midterm year low 
to the pre-election year high for the Dow is about 47%. Most of the lows have occurred in January or October, and most of the highs are at the end of the year in the pre-election year. That's next year, 2023, in December, a lot of them on the last trading day of the year. A NASDAQ, an amazing number, kind of incredulous, but this is the truth. 70% um, average gain from the NASDAQ midterm year low to the pre-election year high. That would be the low this year. Could have been the low we hit in February, March. <clears throat> um, again, we see these October lows as well and the December highs. So uh, while we go through this midterm year volatility, um, be prepared for a nice, a nice year-end rally uh, where that sweet spot of the four-year cycle kicks in. Here's a little chart of that sweet spot. You can see Q2, Q3 of the midterm year is the weak spot. Um, and then we have Q4, Q1, and Q2 of the pre-election year. Uh, that's Q4, the midterm year, into the first two quarters of the pre-election year. Dow and S&P average about 20% on average. Um, and the NASDAQ is about 30%, just under 30, about 29 and a half. Um, you can see these gray lines here. So again, this is Q4 of this year, Q1 and Q2 uh, of potentially of, of next year. So get ready for that sweet spot. And the midterm year often brings a loss of uh, congressional seats for the incumbent president. I just updated this table. And what people might want to uh, uh, get excited about or at least have some confidence in is that the best combination is a, a Democratic president and a Republican Congress. And with Biden's approval ratings where they are and the general tendency for uh, especially House seats to swing to the opposing party in the midterm years. Looks like the Republicans have a decent chance of taking back both houses of Congress. And um, it might seem like that's a, a bit of an upheaval, but what we've seen is, you know, Democratic presidents controlled by a, you know, uh, um, sort of more conservative uh, spending Congress with Republicans running it has averaged about 16.4% since 1949 in years that combination. A little, a little line from uh, <clears throat> Warren Buffett to remember, uh, remind us of where we are. This is the CNN Fear and Greed Index back from March 9th when we had that closing low um, for, for the markets. And so you want to remember to be greedy when others are fearful. Uh, and then another sentiment that I, indicator that I look at is investors' intelligence. The percentage of bullish and bearish advisors is a lot of uh, Newsletter writers uh, and, and analysts that are in here, we get, you know, sourced in this in this survey. They they pick it up from what you write, and you can see these different peaks where bears outnumbered bulls, correlating with these low points throughout the years. Um, 08, 09, 6, 15, and 16, the mini bear, the end of um, uh, uh, 2018 there, um, where we had that that sell-off uh, with the, the rate hikes going too fast. Here's the COVID low in 2020, as well as the recent sell-off here on the uh, invasion of Ukraine. Uh, an encouraging sentiment sign for us. Technically speaking, uh, we've been tracking the NDX <clears throat> as sort of the leading um, in, uh, market index for us with all of the tech stocks in there. Um, this is the low that we're looking at holding here. The you know, you draw these support lines with a with a, a, a fat marker or a crayon, not a fine point. Uh, the the intraday the intraday low on February 24th sort of tested that again there, uh, March uh, 8th, 9th, and it looked like we were creating a little W123 swing bottom. But once you break through that 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 middle point in the W, the point two, it's uh, concerning again. But here we are trying to find some support right around 14,000. Uh, having trouble breaking through that 200-day moving average, and now the 50-day is giving us a little trouble. This is updated through yesterday. So technically, we're holding support at that invasion low, but we have uh, definitely some concerns um, getting through that uh, 15,000 level on, on NASDAQ as well as a uh, NASDAQ 100, as well as the 200-day. Um, just a quick look at the seasonal patterns. I want to give a, a, a little time for some questions, but um, here's the typical seasonal pattern for all years going back to uh, 1950 and then um, going back to 1988, which, you know, we like to look at multiple time frames here and uh, post 87 crash when they, you know, instigated circuit breakers and collars 
on, on the New York Stock Exchange, sort of changed the the the, the market, the trading place uh, uh, systemically, um, perhaps for the better. Uh, that that's debatable, but you can see that we still have this sideways pattern from May through October. A lot of people are going to get excited coming up with the sell in May rhetoric, and there people will expect the market to sell off in May and go down. That's not really the pattern. You have the best and worst six months is how we look at it was the trading strategy that Yale created back in 1986. So it's not sell in May and go away. It's reposition in May or reposition when we get our sell signal, which we just got um, a, a week or so ago. I'm going to show you that chart in, a, in just a sec. And um, basically people like to, to refute it, but going back to um, you know the beginning of the data set that we have, uh, first half of last century, it was pretty much buy in May when it was a farming society and a farming economy where, you know, uh, spring planting, it would, would bring all of the, uh, a lot of economic activity into the, into the market. And then it would run through um, to harvest time. Uh, but that flipped after World War II, pretty much with the industrial, uh, military industrial complex and the service economy. A couple of quick looks at, at some of the numbers here. Average performance, best months, seven and a half percent, all back to 1950. 0.8 May through October, $10,000 investment one time in 1950 gains almost $1.4 million versus $3,400 in the worst months. Use our little MACD trigger, which we just had, um, increases that to 8.9% on average and minus 0.4% uh, for the worst months. And the power of compounding um, nearly triples the that the, the return on that $10,000 investment to over $3 million. And that um, little gain becomes a bit of a loss, about $4,700. Um, recent years, and the MACD we used on the buy is 8.17.9. And you'll see that on the chart. as And then on the sell side, it's the 12.26.9. And if you have any questions about that, I can explain that. But recent years, <clears throat> best and worst months, still holding up since we had that um, <laughs> big gain in the worst months since um, after the, the 09 bottom, but it generally about 8% in the Dow and S&P versus about 4% uh, in the worst months. NASDAQ, of course, are going to be a, a bit greater gains, and this is the best eight months. NASDAQ goes to June. You got about 12% in the best eight months in November to June versus 5.5% 5 .5 or so for uh, the worst months. Yes, some, some not so great best months and some uh, pretty decent worst months, but still overall, the seasonal pattern still exists. Here's our MACD sell signal. You can see the 12.26.9. This, this one says 12.25 on, on this piece of software. We run it in Excel ourselves on uh, using the 26 day uh, moving average there. And you can see that crossover right here. Um, we've gone up a little bit giving people some, some time to get out. But generally, this is that crossover sell signal. We start looking after April 1st for the Dow and the S&P, and then June 1st through um, for, for NASDAQ. Quick look at the sector seasonality calendar, and then I'll show you some of our portfolios, and we'll open the floor up to some questions. You can see in the worst months, you've got utilities are positive, computer tech. Um, <clears throat> you get biotech coming in. And, and healthcare uh, down the line. But for the most part, there's a few shorts you can trade here if they set up well. But for the most part, most of the sectors go into their bullish season from just ahead of the, the best six months from October through different months. We can see uh, the B means the beginning of the month, the M means the middle of the month, and the E is the end of the month. We've split the month up in a third. So that's what we're looking at here at, at sector seasonality calendar. Um, and this is right out of the page. I think it's page 92 in this year's almanac. So current portfolios, we just had our sell signal. We have the tactical seasonal switching strategy, not great performance, especially out of the Russell this year. These things happen. Uh, nothing works hundred percent of the time. I like to joke. I don't work hundred percent of the time. I'm sure you guys sleep once in a while. Um, and then you can see where uh, selling the Dow and S&P on the MACD trigger. We're holding on to the Qs and the Russells, and we're picking up a partial position in the bonds, which is what we do um, in the in the worst months, just to park cash. Our sector seasonality table, 
Oh, sugar, I picked the wrong one. I'm going to have to apologize for that. I had the updated version on that, but you can go see that on, on our website. It's doctradersalmanac.com. And then a look at our, our, our stock portfolios. A lot of things got stopped out going through um, the sell-off. So we've got a few positions left. The open position average pretty strong off a couple of points since our last update. Um, and then overall, here's the, here's the large cap portfolio. Uh, since inception, we're up 601% from July 1 versus 266.2 for the S&P. And um, that's the look at the, the newsletter portfolios. Let's just do a little recap. I think we can rally into the end of April but I do expect some more six months weakness, probably a Q4 rally into that sweet spot. Um, I think we'll have the S&P and Dow finish about up five or 10% for the year. NASDAQ might be a little weaker. Um, remember it's the midterm election year where bottom pickers find paradise. You got that sweet spot. Um, and a lot of the negatives have been, been satisfied from the early indicators, but um, <clears throat> we have two main challenges, the Russian invasion, <coughs> excuse me, and the Fed inflation fight, the rate hikes. So remember to be greedy when others are fearful. And if you're interested in coming to join us at the newsletter, you get a free almanac every year, um, as well as all of these targeted strategies for growth and income updates, the switching strategy, sector rotation, seasonal stock basket, and one of the things that I think we do that a lot of folks don't do is we don't just tell you what to buy. We tell you when to buy it and at what price and when to sell it. We provide uh, buy limits and stop losses. And those are not, you know, intraday market, uh, uh, you know, stop losses you put out there. Those are closing on a closing basis. So if one of our stocks or ETFs closes below our stop loss, we sell it. We've got the best six months buy and sell signals, which we just sent out. And the strategy is up 601 versus 266. So a code, if you want to join us, it's one year 22 MSV for Money Show Virtual and two year 22 for MSV. Only 150 bucks a year uh, versus 20 bucks a month, 250 for two years. It's quite a good deal. And we'll probably be raising rates later this year as we revamp uh, our website and service and uh, adjust for inflation a little bit. So thank you and um, appreciate the time. I'm glad I was able to get up and running and we got a few minutes left for some questions. Thank you so much, Jeff. And yes, we do. We actually have a lot of questions. Um, the first one that I have is from Ronnie and he actually asked it before you even started presenting. But just in case, what is difference in, sorry, what is different in 2022 midterm from other midterm calendar volatilities? Isn't the advantage sell in May and go away? Um, that's a couple of questions. I wouldn't go away. I would definitely reposition and sell losers and get some cash ready for later in the year. It's probably going to be a good time to start looking for new positions. Um, what's different this year? I got to tell you, um, other than the specifics so that it's Russia invading Ukraine and, you know, the new inflation fight with a different Fed, it's, it, you know, different members of the Fed and different presidents in there. It's kind of set it, lining up very typical uh, midterm election year behavior. So uh, sell in May and go away. You can call it what you want, but it's really repositioned in May for us and repositioned from May through June, July. And we've already started doing that. So I wouldn't go away. Uh, I would hang on to your winners, which is the key to investing. Uh, get rid of your losers and other performers and get ready to reposition or start repositioning um, for a better, better buy opportunity, fatter pitch later in Q3, early Q4. The next question that I have is- Any do other inter ones? Do we have time? Yes. Um, the next one that I have is, do international markets tend to mirror the U.S. markets in term of the four-year cycle you reference? Um, considering, you know, U.S. is still, you know, the, the leading uh, currency and economy of the world, to some extent, yes, but they all have, uh, you know, their own personality. And we've done some work uh, on some of the other indexes and some of the other, you know, uh, country indexes, and they tend to follow their own cycle. The thing that's different here with the 
the, the U.S. four-year election cycle is unlike any other nation um, that I know of, uh, we have a regular changeover of government. We don't have any votes of no confidence in these battles that go on. Um, so good, bad, or, 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 or whatever, it, it's different. And we know that every November, for the most part, we're going to get a new, pre you know, we're going to get an election. And every four years, we're going to have a, either a new president or the same one being reelected for, for two years in a row. And I, it does drive the global pattern to, to, to some extent, but not completely. They have their own issues as well and um, their own seasonal holiday influences and cultural influences, but uh, it, it's generally there. And we have time for just the last question. Have you applied your theories in crypto? Um, uh, sort of, we, we've looked at some of the seasonal patterns of crypto and um, right now crypto uh, doesn't have enough statistical you know data to really form a seasonality what have we got about 10 12 years or so so we look for for more like a 20-year pattern but um it seems to be tracking general market seasonality uh, i've seen some <clears throat> discussions that it might even be leading the market a little bit right now but i'm concerned with the you know the fad and 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 the, the you know the the sort of tulip uh craze that we have going on here or dot-com craze so uh we're reluctant because it's not hasn't been around long enough, but we're looking at it. And generally it looks like it's tracking, um, correlating well with the S&P, but maybe the, and the dollar as well. Though there are some periods I've seen where it doesn't correlate at all. So it, it's still, it's still up in the air if we can, if we can find a pattern there. We're still looking for one. Awesome. Well, that concludes our time. Thank you so much, Jeff, for joining us today and presenting. We always um, love having you join us. And everyone else, thank you so much for your amazing questions. And please stay tuned for more presentations coming up today. Will I see you in Vegas? Uh, yes, of course. And everyone, uh, Jeff will be in person in our face-to-face -face Money Show Las Vegas, May 9th through the 11th. So please check our website to how you can attend the show and see Jeff in person. Yep, looking forward to it. Thanks, Aya. Thank you. Bye. Thanks, everyone. Bye-bye.